for 15 or 20 minutes or so and then hand things over to Pascal and let uh, her talk for a little while. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A. So I'm gonna share my screen here and hope that that works, All right? Uh, and if somebody could just like unmute their microphone to let me know that you can, or just give me a thumbs up, you can still hear me and see the screen. Okay, we're good? Yeah. All right, wonderful. Um, so this is a, a, a picture of Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, two pictures obviously, one when they're younger and one when they're a little older doing exactly the same thing. So I kind of love it. It almost looks like they're wearing the same thing too, but even though they're not. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the context for Camus' The Plague, which is to say uh, mid-20th century French existentialism. Uh, and I want to start talking about that subject by talking about uh, Sartre and Beauvoir, two major figures uh, when it comes to 20th century French existentialism, along with Camus. So in the mid-1930s, Sartre had this idea to write uh, a philosophical study about the relationship between the world of inanimate objects and human consciousness. And in particular, he was interested in the way the inanimate objects of the world could kind of press in upon human, human consciousness, as it were, the result being a kind of destabilization and disorientation uh, you know, of you know, the person's consciousness, where you start to feel nauseated, you start to feel despair, you start to feel anxiety, you start to feel you know, maybe angst, and he was going to write this study that was going to have sections and subsections, sort of like what he would eventually do uh, with his book, uh, Lettre et Néon, Being in Nothingness. And it was de Beauvoir who suggested to him, why don't you write it as a novel instead of as a philosophical treatise? Uh, the result was Sartre's novel, La Nausée, right, translated into English as nausea, which even at the end of his life, he regarded as one of the best things that he'd ever written. Uh, so 10 years later, Camus is gonna do the same thing with the plague. He's going to write a philosophical treatise that will masquerade as a novel, basically, uh, or he's going to dress up a philosophical treatise in the costume uh, of a novel. This is a curious component of the history of existentialism. You have all of these very literary philosophers like uh, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and very philosophical novelists like Dostoevsky, and Kafka, and then you have writers like Sartre and de Beauvoir and Camus, where it's like, I don't even know, are they philosophers who write novels? Are they novelists who write philosophy? Are they just French existentialists? The labels all sort of fail. Uh, so here's Camus rocking that James Dean-esque existentialist look. Uh, incidentally, uh, you probably know the story of James Dean killed at a tragically young age in 1955 in a car accident. Camus would die five years later in 1960, also in a car accident. So they've got that uh, point of contact as well as just the, the really cool look that he's rocking here. Um, as a 20th century French existentialist, Camus is focused on the absurdity of existence, the fact that it might not be without any sort of meaning outside uh, of ourselves. He's interested in the ways in which this fact, once we confront it, revolts us, and in the ways in which we can revolt against it and insist on making our lives meaningful despite the fact that it appears, you know, the world itself might be without meaning. Uh, so he's very interested in the kind of labor and effort and vigilance that it's going to require to make your life an authentic life and to give it meaning uh, so that you don't succumb to its absurdity and find yourself in a state of despair, uh, you know, or anxiety or angst or depression. Um, there's a, a sense in which we today uh, have kind of lost sight of these kinds of questions, I think, and these kinds of efforts, probably because they're really intimidating and frightening and it's much easier to just put uh, quotation marks around things or turn them into memes or ironize them or make a sarcastic comment or put a humorous caption you know, beneath a photograph of somebody who spends his life uh, making an effort to try to figure out you know, a way in which life could be meaningful in a positive fashion for as many human beings uh, as possible. So there's something to think about there in terms of maybe just the general American conception of French existentialism where we have a stereotypical image in mind that probably 
right, you know, uh, belies the actual truth of what, you know, these people were about at this time as a result of the circumstances they were living through. Um, so here's Camus again. I had uh, a really, really funny caption under this one too, but then I deleted it because uh, it was also kind of dumb. And sometimes it's better to just look at the picture and ponder what it is you're seeing, right? Not everything needs to be turned into uh, a meme. Anyway, so Pascal and I are teaching a Great Expeditions class this spring, uh, at the end of which we were supposed to go over to Europe, to England and France in particular, to see a bunch of sites associated with World War I and World War II. That's the subject of the class. It's not just a history class, though. It's an interdisciplinary class where we're talking about music of this time period, the art of this time period, the philosophy of this time period, the literature of this time period, uh, and so on and so forth. So we really wanted to do some work of either existentialist literature or maybe theater of the absurd. And back in September, you know, the debate was, what are we going to assign our students, right? What are we going to have them read over spring break 2020? Was it going to be uh, Sartre's La Nausée? Was it going to be, you know, Camus' L'Etranger or uh, Beauvoir's L'Invité? or maybe Samuel Beckett's play on Entendant Godot, Waiting for Godot. Uh, all of these are works of literature that are kind of grouped under that, that heading of literature, the absurd or existentialist literature. For some reason, and I don't wanna pry into the workings of the cosmos too closely here, but for some reason we decided that the novel we would have our students read over spring break 2020, back in September of 2019, was indeed going to be Camus' La Peste, uh, The Plague which turned out to be prescient, again, in ways I don't really like to consider too often. I hope we're not determining the course of events, Pascal, uh, on a world, world historical level. Anyway, so we chose um, the play. We chose La Peste. Right? Uh, here's the you know, cover in French, cover in English. It's a novel, the subject of which is not just the calamities that we can often be faced with in life, but the calamity of life itself, right? The absurdity of existence, something I mentioned earlier. Uh, what and how, right? What people do and how people react when all of a sudden they find themselves being confronted with this fact of existence, right? It's absurdity uh in a way where they normally aren't you know and repeatedly day after day after day suddenly so many distractions that we had in place right to keep that absurdity at arm's length are gone resulting in its being much much closer to us than you know we're comfortable with even though we still got right now plenty of distractions um to keep ourselves busy with so that we don't have to think about all of this stuff too often, too closely. One thing that's important to note here, though, is that, you know, uh, Camus doesn't think that this is, you know, something that we only have to deal with from time to time in moments of great historical unrest. I see a lot of people, hear a lot of people right now saying, you know, we're living through history right now. And Camus would say, well, you're always living through history, right? The absurdity of your existence is something that's always there for you to be con, con for, ah, sorry, something that's always there for you to confront uh, day after day, should you choose to. Uh, we're always basically surrounded by and infected by the plague, you know, when it comes to the metaphysical problems of evil, of the fact that this is fundamentally an unjust world, that more often than not uh, seems to be you know, indifferent to what becomes of us within it. Um, okay, so there are a lot of levels on which you can read this novel. Um, I'll talk about them, I'll group them into three sections, right? The literal level, the historical allegorical level, and the philosophical level. The funny thing is that for the 70 years or so that went by between the novel's publication and today, you know, the overwhelming majority of people didn't read it on a literal level. They read it as a historical allegorical novel, maybe about World War II, right? You know, or as a philosophical text and just sort of saw the surface level plot of the novel to be something, you know, some, that's something to be deciphered. Um, now it's impossible to read the novel in any other way than focusing on its, its literal content, the fact that it's about a town in which a plague breaks out. Um, 
in the small groups. What's that? Somebody said something. <laughs> All, right. All right, so where am I here? Um, this is a really cool kind of uh, illustration from the mid 14th century when the Black Death killed over 100 million people uh, in the world when the population of the world was actually, I think it was a little less than 500 million. And some estimates have the Black Death killing as many as 200 million people. So we're talking about something that came pretty close to wiping out human existence. The, this is the last time when the population of the earth actually decreased, uh, you know, substantially over the course of a period of, I don't know, a year or five years or, or 10 years. It's been going up ever since then. Anyway, so uh, La Peste is a novel about a literal outbreak of plague in an Algerian coastal city where eventually uh, cordon sanitaire is put up uh, around the city so that nobody who's in it can leave and nobody who's outside of it can come in. And it just becomes a question of who's going to outlast the other, the inhabitants uh, of the city or the plague. Um, there's a sequence of events that takes place that will probably strike us as um, alarmingly familiar. Uh, at first, at the first signs that something might be wrong, people disregard it, you know, dead rats turning up and people just kind of look at them and go, ah, dead rat, and kind of continue on with their day. Uh, secondly, as the corpses of the rats start to pile up and people start to become infected, people begin to acknowledge the fact that something is wrong and that there does seem to be some sort of disease afoot, but they don't take it seriously enough. They don't think that it will necessarily affect them in their lives where they are. Slowly, uh, they're forced to recognize the gravity of the situation, where by the time they fully recognize the gravity of the situation, it's too late and the plague is kind of running rampant. Um, you have things like funerals that initially uh, proceed according to the customary methods and then become strictly family affairs and then become things that people can only attend from a great distance and then become things that people can't attend at all uh, and then eventually become mass burials. Uh, the death count keeps going up so that maybe one week if you hear a hundred people have died on a given day it strikes you as a lot of people and you're alarmed uh, and saddened by this fact then two weeks later, you hear that a thousand people have died on a day and you're kind of happy because that's a good day. So things like that are happening where uh, the numbers just kind of get confusing and disorienting and nauseating, uh, I suppose. There's violence. There are a lot of people who are doing dedicated work uh, in an attempt to combat the plague. There's incomprehension and befuddlement. There's price gouging, right? All of these are things that we have seen over the course of the past two months, uh, of course. There are sanitation squads dedicated to taking care of other human beings uh, and maintaining hygiene. Um, so it's a really weird experience to read this novel now, a novel that was written 70 years ago that describes in vivid detail uh, our own reality in a way where it seems to have, the novel seems to have more to do with our world now than it had to do with the world it was actually written to describe. It's a bizarre uh, experience. Reading it this spring was one of the stranger reading experiences I've had for a while. So the historical allegorical right, level of reading uh, the novel now. Is that correct French there? Pascal, is that decent? La peste reste devant la tour Eiffel? Okay, good. Um, where uh, the main way in which people read the novel from its publication in 1947 up until about four or five months ago as a his, uh, historical allegory, allegorical, blah, 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 blah uh, historical allegory uh, about the Nazi occupation uh, of France during World War II, where the, not only the Nazis, but also the Vichy collaboration, collaborationist government led by uh, Marshal Patin, you know, they're the plague. And it's up to the citizens of the town in the novel who are dedicated to fighting the plague to, to get rid of it, where if you're reading it on this allegorical level, that would be members of uh, the French resistance, La Resistance, which Camus is actually a member of. He wrote for the Resistance publication uh, magazine called Combat, I believe. Uh, I think he actually published the first excerpts of the novel uh, in that magazine, if I'm not mistaken. 
I think Sartre actually served in the war itself as like a meteorologist who got ca captured on like his first day of battle or something like that because he's Sartre and he's just smoking his cigarettes and drinking his coffee probably and not paying attention to what's going on. Um, so he was involved in the war too, uh, was a prisoner of war for a time. Samuel Beckett as well, the author of Waiting for Godot, was involved with the French resistance and narrowly escaped being captured by the Gestapo and sent to a concentration camp when he and his wife escaped to the south of France. They weren't married at the time, they were just partners then. Um, uh, so anyways, there's this whole kind of historical context and reality for the novel where it was kind of like the general assessment was that this is what the novel is really about. It's not actually about a town in which there's an outbreak uh, of plague. Um, but reading the novel a little bit too narrowly in this regard uh, would be a mistake because like I said, the novel works on several levels, and even just within this historical uh, context, it works on in more ways than just the one where it can be read as about the Nazi occupation of France during World War II. This is the town of Oran, Algeria, where the novel takes place, city I should say, and you know, where it's worth pointing out that the novel does not take place in a town or city in France. It takes place in a city in Algeria. Algeria was colonized by the French in 1830. In 1849, there was an epidemic of cholera in the city of Oran, an epidemic that was tied to the presence of colonial forces within the city. So all of a sudden now, right, it's the French themselves who are the plague in Oran and not the Nazis who are the plague in France. So the novel, um, Things are a little bit more intricate and complex than just the one simple historical allegorical interpretation that's been favored for the past 70 years. Camus doesn't want us to think that there are good guys and bad guys here and that it's really simple. The French are good, the Nazis are bad. Um, you know, he wants us to understand that the, in this context, the context of the colonialization of um, colonization of Algeria, the French were sort of in the wrong. They were the plague that needed to be gotten rid of, which they eventually were um, not until after Camus' death, though, I think in the early 1960s when Algeria finally won independence from France. All uh, right. Uh, and then there's the third level on which the novel can be read as a work of philosophy. Just a few other titles by Camus up here. Uh, L'Etranger, The Stranger, his most famous novel. Uh, Le Myth de Sisyphe, uh, The Myth of Sisyphus, which we have students read an excerpt from in TNC. Uh, at least we did. I'm not sure if we still do. I think we still do, though. L'Homme Revolté uh, is a series of essays like The Myth of Sisyphus. L'Etranger is a novel like La Peste. Anyways. Uh, as a work of philosophy, right, a pest, the plague, uh, is about the human condition right, and uh, metaphysical questions of evil, of the absurdity of existence, of the fact that we do indeed live in a world that more often than not seems to be indifferent to our own fate and that doesn't act right or operate in accordance with our own wishes or desires, the fact that it often seems to act um, indirectly this sort of opposite kind of way, uh, where in the face of this calamity, the calamity of existence itself, and that this is the kind of world that we do in fact live in, right? you know, Camus is interested in you know, how people respond to that, especially in historical moments when it's made really clear and sort of brought home to bear on us that this is in fact actually the kind of world we live in. We maybe are capable of distracting ourselves during sort of normal times into thinking that the world isn't like this and that it actually will respect our own wishes and aims and ambitions and desires and goals. And then something like this happens and suddenly people are reminded of the fact that that is not how uh, the world works. How do people respond to this? This is what Camus is interested in. What are the various forms of responses right, that human beings are capable of in the face of this calamity? Where ultimately he's, uh, let me see, where am I here? Uh, he says that it's not about whether or not people respond to this calamity in a positive way. It's about the fact that whether or not they do, you have to act as though they did, 
if that makes sense. I'll say it once again, because I'm not sure that sense, it's sense to me syntactically, right? You know, uh, so he's not sort of interested in sort of putting, you know, things in the, in the scales here and finding out whether people are ultimately good or ultimately bad. He says it doesn't matter if we're ultimately good or ultimately bad. It's our own individual responsibility to live as if we were ultimately good, right? Incapable of standing up in the face of this calamity and insisting on our own freedom rather than giving way to despair. Uh, it's precisely, in fact, at the moment when we might be most, when we might, when we have the most reason to give way uh, to angst or despair or depression, right, that we have to kind of put the shoulder to the wheel once more and engage in the labor of affirming uh, our freedom and making our lives meaning through, through, meaningful through constant vigilance, uh, you know, and exercise, both the intellect and the body, uh, and so on and so forth. The phrase I just used, putting the shoulder to the wheel, should remind us of Sisyphus, um, whom most of us are probably familiar with through that particular text and the excerpt that we have the students read in Texts and Critics. Right? Sisyphus, of course, is the famous Greek king who, when he dies, find himself, finds himself in the underworld where uh, he's you know, sort of doomed to this one unending task for all of eternity where he has to carry or push this boulder up a mountain where every time he is just about to settle the boulder on the top of the mountain, his work done, the boulder slips and falls back down and he has to walk down after it and start the whole process again. You know, it's the sort of thing that in the context of Greek mythology is meant to be seen as a punishment, right, as a doom indeed. Um, Camus sees it both as a metaphor for our own day-to-day -day lives where every day we have to wake up, put the shoulder to the wheel, try to get the mountain to the top, you know, only uh, at the end of the day when we go to bed, right, you know, we find ourselves waking up the next morning kind of having to start all over again, you know, in the face of the absurdity of our own existence. It's an understanding of life that could easily lead one to give way to despair uh, depression, you know, seeing life as, you know, pathetic or futile, um, you know, or, or seeing this kind of work as, as useless. But uh, Camus thought that, you know, despite the fact that this was indeed the case, maybe even overwhelmingly the case, we had an obligation, right, you know, as human beings who are capable of making meaning by a way of art, by, a, you know, language, uh, in we had an obligation to not thus give way to despair, but to put our shoulder to the wheel each day and to do this work. So existentialism is not actually a philosophy of despair. It's a philosophy of responsibility, right, in the face of absurdity, right, where uh, you exercise this responsibility as opposed to giving way to um, despair. So this is Camus' understanding of Sisyphus. We have to see this as a metaphorical or as a metaphor for human existence. Uh, where it then becomes paramount that we imagine Sisyphus as basically being pleased with his work, right? Pleased with taking up the job day after day after day, waking up each morning renewed to start again, trying to push the boulder up to the top of the hill in an effort to, you know, make one's existence meaningful rather than giving way to despair. How do we conceive of Sisyphus today in 21st century Right. American culture, we conceive of him as somebody who can protect our precious hoard of toilet paper from tumbling to the ground. Just more sort of food for thought there. Uh, I'll turn things over to Pascal now. Let me just exit out of this full screen view. How do I do that? How do I do that? Oh, da -da, da -da, da -da. Stop share. That work? All right, take it away, Pascal. And that was fantastic. Oh, wow, thanks. Yeah, you, there's so many things that you mentioned that I want to bring up again. And cool. now I'm going to just kind of pick up where you left off. And I think that it's really important to note that Camus did not consider himself an existentialist. Yep. He resisted the term. Yep. He saw himself as a moralist and a humanist. And in a moralist uh, point of view, he believed in freedom, equality, and justice. And so um, that's really important because 
you know, we do, like, like Ben said, we have this image of the French and they're there with their wine and their cigarettes and their, this is bullshit, um, it is life and this is how it is, so fuck it, huh? And they do kind of, you know, that, that reputation doesn't come from nowhere. <laughs> but it doesn't relieve um, human beings of agency. And um, what Camus is going to do is he's, he's not going to offer any kind of consolation for the chaos and the meaningless of life. Um, the meaninglessness of life. In fact, he was um, played an important role, um, philosophically speaking, defining the term absurdity. Um, and, um, you know, he defined it, uh, absurdisme as um, referring to the following conundrum the human tendency to seek meaning in life while we are simultaneously in, unable. Um, to find any kind of purpose in a chaotic universe and in their irrational universe. And so Camus, in his novel, La Peste, you know, we, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, a global pandemic, it's nothing we've ever seen before. And, you know, I, it was interesting because I usually, I teach La Peste all the time, I never hear anything about it, you know, it kind of sits in the corner and now all of a sudden, there's this diaspora of writing and all of these people are talking about Camus La Peste is showing up all over the place. Camus is so hot right now. But you know, we go and we turn to Camus because we're searching for meaning. We need explanations. We want some kind of help, some kind of guidance in this meaningless situation. And um, Camus is not gonna offer any kind of solace or any kind of consolation for the meaninglessness of, of life. And um, I've got a couple quotes that I pulled from the book. Um, he says about the sickness, the sickness, the plague, with the blight, the human condition. You could read it on all levels. I like reading it on the philosophical level because then you can put the war meaning in, you can put the occupation of Algeria because Camus was the, born in Algeria of Pienoir parents. His parents were colonizers of Algeria and he had to flee Algeria and he um, and also tried to flee Paris because he was in Paris during when the Nazis came in to occupy Paris. So um, he has this, you know, close relationship with this, but he says, you know, ainsi la maladie qui apparemment avait forcé les habitants à une solidarité d'assiéger, brisait en même temps les associations traditionnelles et renvoyait les individus à leur solitude. Cela faisait du désarroi. So I'll translate this for you. This is my translation, not the official translation, because I don't have a copy of that, so I don't know. It's probably better than what I have come up with, but the sickness which had apparently forced the inhabitants into the solidarity of the besieged, had also simultaneously broken traditional relationships and associations, sending individuals back to their own solitude. This caused disarray and confusion. And so we're not gonna get any, any kind of solace for this. Um, for this meaninglessness of life. And in fact, a, a central event in the, in the novel is a very, very perturbing scene where a young boy suffers terribly and then dies of the plague while the doctor um, at Tahu and the doctor Rieu, they're all there because they had given this child medication that they were hoping would save his life. All it did was prolong his suffering. And so, you know, in, in going to this, back to this allegory and this phenom phenomenological approach to how does human consciousness face its own condition. And so Sartre in this treatise, he gives us these characters, but they're not like real people, they're archetypes. And it takes, when you read the novel, if you don't understand that you're reading a philosophical treatise, it's a little bit flat, the characters are flat, they don't have a lot of depth to them, and it's because they're not true characters. They are um, a philosophical look at different ways in which human consciousness can face the type of um, you know, suffering that it has to face on a daily basis. And so for Sartre, in, or excuse me, for Camus, all over in this novel, for Tahu, for Rieu, for a lot of the main characters, when they refer to the plague, they're talking about something much bigger 
than the plague. They're talking about the meaninglessness of life, the inevitable, unstoppable evil that exists, right? And then how do we fight this endless battle that seems to have no solution? You know, just like the Sisyphus, like there's never going to be an ultimate, you know, solution. There's never going to be, there's never, it's never going to end. And so these archetypes, we have a few archetypes. I'm just going to go over them really quickly. I know that we don't have a lot of time. Dr. Rieu, he's our main character. He is a practical man. He is objective. He's put his emotions aside and he is working day in and day out to fight the plague. He does not believe in God. He is not doing this for any grandiose reason. He's doing it because it's his job. And in fact, sometimes he even questions, why did I get into this work? If I had known that I would be fighting the plague, maybe I wouldn't decide to be become a doctor. He doesn't, he doesn't have all these grandiose ideas about it. And you know, a lot of times all throughout this novel, this, this novel is full of war terminology. The vocabulary and the words that are used are very straight out of World War I and World War II. And so it's you know, very much easy to read this against the glorification of battle, glorifying soldiers, and all of this kind of romanticization of war. So it can be read on that level, but I, like Ben says, I prefer to, you know, look at it on a more philosophical level so that everything can follow underneath, whether it's war, whether it's an actual plague, whether, you know, whatever it is, whatever suffering that, you know, besets us. We have um, Tahu who is this wonderful man who is he's a wonderful man and he's stuck in Oran for some reason that we don't know he arrived in Oran a couple weeks before the plague starts and he immediately organizes as volunteers to work with sanitation he is ahead of the city you know the city's a little slow the administrators want to make the prisoners clean up the dead and he's like no 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 no, no. we're gonna we're gonna fight this plague and he's like central and Tahu um he actually we learn later in the novel that Tahu has a very strong moral code and it comes from the fact that his father was a judge and his father, he, he had gone to his father's work and watched his father condemn a man to death. And he just never could accept that and could just never, ever, ever believe that in any way could he ever accept the killing of another human being. And so he's got this really, really strong moral code that's leading him through everything. He's just, uh, he is the, the hero of the novel. And guess what? He gets the plague and he dies. So why does, why does Camus kill him off? Because the plague does not care. The plague kills innocent children. The plague kills the most valiant, strong-hearted, morally upstanding citizen. The plague does not care. And in fact, the plague spares our most evil um, character, who's Cotard. And Cotard is a criminal. He's a war criminal. We, well, we don't know what he's done wrong. All we know is that he tried to hang himself to escape some kind of punishment. And he is selfish. He's a profiteer. He's making money on the black market. He's making money off of the plague. You know, we see some of that going on in our society now. And he says, in the middle of the novel, je me sens bien mieux que nous, uh, que nous avons la peste chez nous. I feel a lot better now that we have the plague amongst us. And so, and you know what's interesting is that Rieu, who is our true hero, but he's just very flat. He is just, a, he's a Sisyphus. He's a relentless worker. He doesn't judge anyone. He doesn't judge Cotard for his reactions. He just observes all humans' reactions to this plague based on their own inner turmoil and their own inner struggle. We have another really important character named Rambert, who is very similar to Camus himself because Rambert is a um, journalist, just like Camus was writing for his, um, you know, his magazine. He's trapped in Oran when the plague breaks out. He's madly in love. He's separated from the love of his life who's lost in, in, who's left in France. And he's faced this horrible 
turmoil of what is the meaning of life, right? What's the point? If, it, if it's not love, what is it? And so therefore he spends the first three quarters of the novel trying to get out of town, trying to escape. He's like paying people to get through the wall. He's doing all kinds of shady things to get out until he learns that the Dr. Rieux is also separated from his wife. And he sees that the doctor is also living the same struggle between personal suffering and collective suffering. And the doctor has decided to put his personal suffering aside to help the collective. And when Rambert sees that, he has a change of heart and he decides to stay. We also have one other, there's lots of characters, but there's one other character that I want to talk to you about before I kind of open it up. And there's so many things that I didn't get to say, but I do want to give everybody time to, to talk. Um, is the father Panelou. He is a very learned Jesuit priest. And he gives these, you know, grandiose sermons at the church and gathers the people to tell them that the plague is the scourge sent by God to punish them for their unfaithfulness. And, you know, there's a really critical moment in the novel where both the priest and the doctor witness the death of this innocent boy. And then they discuss, you know, how do they interpret this? And the doctor is atheist and he refuses to believe that there would be a God that would do this kind of thing. And the father Penelou says, you know, actually this is a test of faith. And if God wills the innocent to die, there's a reason that we can't see and we must accept it. And so guess what? The father gets the plague, he refuses treatment and he dies. And so it's, it's interesting how the plague just kind of kills everybody off and very few people survive. Um, Grand survives, Cotard survives, the evil, you know, profiteer. At the end of the novel, he has a psychotic break, opens up on the crowd with a gun and goes on a shooting spree and then he gets arrested, but he doesn't get killed off by the plague. And so there is just this, this sense of absolute absurdity and meaninglessness facing this situation. And in the end, Tahu, who is our, our moral, who dies of the plague, but he's the one whose father was the judge and he's the one who's led the volunteer effort. He says, I'm gonna skip reading you the French because in, in the interest of time, but he says that when he's talking to his friend, you know, because he and the doctor become best friends, he says, I'm only saying that in this world there are plagues and there are victims. And one must, as much as possible, refuse to accept the plague. I've decided to place myself on the victim's side in all occasions, at least to limit the damage. Among them, I can at least search for how we arrive at the third category, which is peace. And the doctor, who's listening to him quietly, and who is kind of helpless, but is working tirelessly, but doesn't really see a solution. He asks and the doctor sat up a bit and asked him if he had any idea of which path to take to arrive at peace. And Tahu responds simply, he says, yes, sympathy. And in the very end, the, the plague is finally leaving the city and, you know, everybody is elated. There are no more deaths and there's cries of joys in the street. But Ria knows that it's not really a true final end or a final victory. This is at the point of the novel where we learn that Ria, the doctor, is also the narrator and the writer of the story. And Ria decided to write the account that ends here as to not remain among the silent in order to bear witness on behalf of the victims, to at the very least leave a memory of the injustice and the violence and to simply tell what one learns in the midst of a plague, that there is in men more to admire than to scorn. But he knew that this chronicle could not be a definitive victory, only the testimony of what had to be done and what would have to be repeated, despite personal turmoil, men who, unable to become saints, but refusing to accept the plagues, would strive at least to be doctors. 
Ryu remembered that this joy was always in jeopardy, the joy of the end of the plague. The plague never dies or disappears completely. So I've skipped a lot of things, but I just want to open up for discussion and um, give everybody a chance to, to talk a little bit. I just want to say, Pascal and Ben, this was absolutely extraordinary. I, um, I, I'm so glad it's being recorded because I know that I would want to watch it again and again. Phenomenal. I, I so appreciate this. Um, let me take a look and see if we have a question in the chat. Um, no, we don't yet. Pascal's comment just that the Great Expeditions trip is going to go in 2021. And it's, it's really wonderful because we actually have members of the Advisory Council on this call. So they know they've sponsored some of our student scholarships. So that's really wonderful for them to know this. So um, I would just like to open it for questions. If you have a question, if you would just raise your hand and the floor will be yours. Thank you. I'll just, well, well, it sounds like nobody's asking a question. Is that right? Yes, yeah, sir. nobody's raised their hand yet. Uh, I'll just point out uh, maybe a couple things. And um, if this is something that you wanted to send out to people elsewhere, you could. Yes. Uh, Pascal mentioned that Camus is very hot right now. Uh, sales of the, the plague have gone up 1,000%. Oh, <laughs> You know, in the last in the last couple of months, where for every one copy that would usually be sold, now a thousand copies are, are being sold. Uh, and she mentioned that people are writing about this novel and doing conversations like this about the novel, not just all over the country, uh, but all over the world. Uh, and I thought I'd just mention a few of these. And again, if you want, Elsmarie, I can send you the links to these. Uh, Jacqueline Rose has just written a, a long piece in the London Review of Books. Uh, in their most recent edition that I only just got, I think, yesterday or the day before, which was very convenient for this talk, and that was a really good piece. Um, Jeff Dyer wrote about it for uh, The New Yorker. He's somebody, one of whose books we actually read in the Great Expeditions class on Missing of the Sum, which is a book about World War I. Uh, and then uh, Alan DeBotten, who's like a, a kind of preeminent popular philosopher, I guess, uh, at the present time, he's written about it in the, the New York Times, and that's just to mention a few, um, I don't know, I guess, prestigious publications in which Camus has been discussed just over the course of the past few weeks and with respect to how relevant this, this novel is in the, the present situation. Um, ben, uh, Michelle, uh, if you could just send those in the chat, maybe the links to that. I'll give it a, I'll give it a whirl. It'll take me a minute. Oh, you know what? We can do that later. I'll send it out. So okay. We'll save some. Yes, Max. I'll get them to you, Michelle, though. Max, go ahead. Um, I had a question. Uh, Professor Hickman, you uh, touched on a little bit that um, Camus was from Algeria. And I was wondering how both of you guys thought that experience um, differed his writing from, his, from de Beauvoir and Sartre. Uh, because they were both born in Paris, and I think that's a huge discrepancy in how they grew up and what influenced their philosophies in writing. Yeah, and it's, it's something that ultimately led to the break between Camus and Sartre, where they ended up on different sides of the political divide with respect to, you know, um, questions concerning communism, with respect to questions concerning right, the fate of Algeria and its relationship to France. So it definitely played, you know, a role in the different opinions that that they held in the different positions that they came to. I don't know if you have more to say there, Pascal. Okay. Um, yes, and you know, I think that one of the things that I've noticed in their works, um, politically, yes, it certainly affected him. And they, you know, there's a lot of talk about what especially affected this book. I mean, that is set in Ohan and, and that, um, but also that he had a, his own bout with tuberculosis, which could have had something to do with him choosing the plague. But um, there is this, excuse me, there is this um, ever present aesthetic of sun yeah. and weather in Camus' writing that is very, very specific to Camus. It's like the sun is this inescapable burning, just just comes down on you and just it, it the weather and he starts it in this book he starts it in all of his novels there's always this sense and i think it's his aesthetic that was really really shaped 
by his childhood in Algeria that you really see that's so, so different from our Parisian existentialists. Uh, there's also something to be said for the fact that this was something I was going to talk about uh, in my presentation, but then I wasn't sure where I was for time, so I skipped over it as I did a few other things, like Pascal said. There's so much, so much more to talk about here. Uh, it's interesting, though, with the plague. Uh, it's it's not only a novel that that people are rediscovering now and reading right now and falling in love with all over again. It's also people or a novel that people are. Um, you know, reading again right now and, and, and finding fault with and, and criticizing because for a novel that takes place in an Algerian coastal city that is curiously devoid of actual Arab Algerians, there are basically none whatsoever within the novel. Uh, and the same can be said for the absence of, you know, female characters. Uh, Hryu's wife is gone, Humbert's, you know, love interest is gone, all of the, the women in the Arabs in the novel are, are mentioned, you know, as a kind of collective off to the side, if they're mentioned at all. And so it's just all of these, you know, white male European main characters where the critique is that, oh, okay, so if I actually want to engage in the task of trying to figure out how to make my life meaningful in the face of absurdity. It really helps to be a male European, apparently. Um, but then, you know, the, the way in which you combat this is, goes back to what Pascal was saying earlier. It's like, there's not really any characters here. It's the, you know, all of the characters are flat. They stand for positions. It's, it's not, you know, a novel that has characters in the sense that we think of novels having characters in, you know, or plots in the sense that we think of a novel having a, a plot in. It's about ideas. It's a novel of ideas. There's a reason why the women are missing. If you if you think about yeah. how it was written as an allegory, if yeah. you, the men are separated from their loves. And it is also to highlight a very important phenomenological study that Camus is doing in this novel, which is the ter inner turmoil that each individual faces between their personal struggle and their personal suffering, which do you put that above or beneath the collective struggle, struggle. You know, both Rieu and Rambert have to set aside their true love in order to focus on a love of their community. And so there's this, there's this tension that, you know, Camus wants to showcase. And I think that's one of the reasons why he separates all the women. There is one woman in the novel and that's Rieu's mother. And yeah. she's sits in the corner and yeah. is a witness to the yeah. she's she's praised for her uh effacement of her own <laughs> needs and, and wants in favor of those of her son but there might also it struck me that there might also be something to be said for the fact that it's a a, a novel about you know the form the kinds of the different kinds of plagues that uh, we see sort of throughout the society that we've built for ourselves. And I guess that's a society that historically has been predominantly, you know, sort of erected or, 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 or built or, uh, you know, enforced by men. So I don't know if there's something there where, uh, you know, yeah, women didn't they have, uh, you know, as much to do with bringing all of this ill into the world in the, in the first place. And therefore it's kind of the men who have to deal with it in the novel. I don't know if there's any any substance there, but just a thought I had. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fascinating to me because this is the first time in my life that I've read this book in the context of a plague. Mm -hmm. And um, and I've read it many times and it's, it's very foreign to me to be talking about it in this way. And I yeah. have this, this this urge to be like, yes, but that's not really what the novel's about, but it kind it is though. Yeah. And, you know, like Ben was saying, it's we don't want to reduce it to only one of its meanings when it has different levels of meanings. And and um, what is interesting is that this study of human consciousness, this phen phenomenological study of how each individual reacts to the adversity that is in the world, is the fascinating part. Um, and it's really interesting to see when, and, and I think that's what's kind of a little bit alarming. I don't know how it was for you, Ben, but I, I remember while, while I was rereading this for just as our own pandemic was developing and I was seeing numbers at the beginning, the surreal statistics uh, that, that, that Camus talks about. And he's, he's like, well, you know, as Leo is like, you know, a thousand dead, what does that even mean? Nobody could even understand it. 
Um, and, and, and all of this was very much, you know, really hitting home because we were getting these kind of statistics, you know, from Europe and these things are developing here. And, and it was alarming. And I remember, you know, contacting Ben and being like, Ben, this is a little bit scary. Um, <laughs> How do we how do we deal with this with our students? Because we're right in the middle of seeing this, you know, where I'm going like, oh, and now they're hauling the dead off in trains. And then I see, you know, the military convoy on TV in Italy where they're moving the dead to other cemeteries because they've run out of room. And all of this, you know, all of a sudden a very literal poignancy that I had never experienced before. Yeah. I, uh, I started reading it in early March uh, when things were only kind of just starting to ramp up and when the study abroad trip that I was supposed to go on over spring break was, was still a go because we were still not thinking that this was something that would uh, really affect us too severely here. Um, and as I started reading it, I was reading it and I had my pen in hand and I was jotting down all these little thoughts in the margin about like, oh, this corresponds to you know this thing that happened during the second world war and this correspond and that's all i'm thinking about and i'm jotting down like quasi philosophical thoughts about the absurdity of existence etc and i'm basically you know reading the novel in every way but you know uh the, the sort of literal way of just reading it for the actual story that it's about and then as the days went by you know where i was reading it like this and not like this it just this started to happen, you know, and then by, you know, like March 20th or something like that, uh, right when we were about ready to come back and shifting to online and getting ready to teach the novel, it was like this. I wasn't thinking about these things at all. I wasn't jotting down philosophical thoughts. I wasn't jotting down like historical illusions that I thought Camus was making. I was just reading it for the story it was telling because it was telling the story that I was living. You know, one thing about this novel that I, I'm afraid, you know, all of these millions of people who are now reading it for the first time are going to be disappointed because there's no real hooray, it's over and good wins and evil is vanquished. And, you know, in, in American film and cinema, the good guy always wins and the bad guy suffers a horrible punishment and all is well in the universe. And that doesn't happen in French cinema or French literature or anything like this. It's like, well, no, actually. The struggle goes on. And so how do we not fall into the pit of despair? That's the, always the question that the French are trying to ask themselves. And especially at a time like when, you know, Camus was writing La Peste and, and after a first and second world war, I mean, the French had a very personal understanding of the absurdity of existence. That is something that we are just barely getting a little taste of this month. And um, it's something that I, I've noticed, you know, because I'm half American, half French, I always, the, the difference, the cultural differences between the two um, countries are really big to me and I see them really well. And I just often see how the French are much more willing to open the pot and look and see what kind of rot is in there so that they can better deal with it, I think than the American tendency, which tends to be like, oh, let's not look in that pot. How about we put that under the rug and we're going to pretend that everything is, you know, puppy dogs and rainbows. And, <laughs> and I think that's why if we misunderstand the French approach, it looks like a tumble into the pit when it's not. It's a, you know, the French, they have their symbol of the rooster, uh, le coq, right? Because it's la gaule. And it's because they say, I didn't make this up, the rooster is the animal, the only one who will sing when he's knee deep in shit. Because that's, that's the way it is and we can still sing because there's still love and there's still sympathy and there's still value in fighting that daily fight. Yeah, and this is Tahu's point that he makes towards the end of the novel is that look, we're always already infected with the plague. We are never free and clear from it. It's something that we're always going to have. We're always going to be complicit in things that we would you know otherwise decry and that we in fact do decry despite our complicity in them you know and then the the, the task remains for us to you know live in such a way you know uh, work in such a way be vigilant in such a way that we can reduce that complicity you know down to a minimum you know even though we're aware of the fact that it's something we can never actually rid ourselves of we're always already still going to have the plague 
That's right. And that's that's the, the crux of existentialism. When we are faced with human condition and the absurdity of the meaninglessness of the universe, it doesn't mean that all is sh- and I'm going to just give up and go sit in the corner and eat worms. It is about agency. Yeah. It is human individual agency, our own responsibility to put meaning into the world. That's what we're here to do, to put meaning into the world and to fight that fight and to continue to you know, fight against evil and to fight against absurdity and to fight with sympathy. It's interesting that Tahu says sympathy and not love. Yeah. Right? Because sympathy is less selfish than love. Just extraordinary. Just extraordinary. Anybody for a question before we close this incredible session? I just have too many questions and too many things to say. I'm overloaded. Thank you so much. I'm just going to be thinking for the rest of the life. That's good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go. Wow. And then this was absolutely extraordinary. I think as, as an audience, let's unmute and give a huge round of applause. This was extraordinary. We were all so fortunate to be in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Great weekend, everybody. Thank you. I'll send you those Thank you things guys. tomorrow, Samari. Thank you, Ben. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you. Bye. 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 Oh, oh my goodness. University.